The Lord be with you. Good morning. We are glad to have you with us on this pre-recorded worship service. Hope all is well with you, and we hope you're staying safe. Let us begin with the call to worship. Let us hear what the Lord will speak. God will speak peace to the faithful. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who trust in God.
Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. Let us pray and let us confess our sins. We cannot exist without you, O Lord. Give us grace and forgive us for not doing and thinking what accords with your purpose. We do not do your will nor seek your face. We follow our own counsel and trust in our own way. Forgive us and restore us to fellowship with you. In Jesus' name, amen and believe the good news of the gospel. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ, and Christ died for us, lives for us, and forgives us. Believe in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Our scripture this morning is Matthew 14, 22 through 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, Command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Jesus is trying to get away from the crowds to have some time to pray. He taught the crowds, he fed them. Now he sends them away. He sends his disciples across the sea, the Sea of Galilee. Get into the boat and go across, he says, I'll meet you. And they leave. Finally, Jesus gets his time alone. He goes up the mountain alone, it says. 
And this is the first of several echoes we will hear in this part of Matthew. The other mountains that Jesus climbed, he's alone on the mountain after the transfiguration. He's alone most certainly as he dies on the cross. Here he's alone on the mountain praying. Now the boat is many hundreds of yards away on the water. It's a windy, stormy night. And storms blow up quickly on the Sea of Galilee. In a very few minutes, the weather can change from calm and peaceful to frightening and stormy. And this happened to the disciples that night. The wind and waves batter their tiny boat. And there's another echo, the creation story in which the earth is without form and void. Darkness rules over the face of the primeval waters. Chaos on the water with the wind blowing. That's the opening verses of Genesis on page one in the Bible. Now the idea of walking on the water is found in Job. When God says to Job, who can do things like this? Who can walk on the water? Only God can walk on water. Well, for their part, the disciples are terrified, even more so in the wee hours before dawn when they're struggling to get ashore and they see a ghost walking toward them. They see this figure walking across the water. They're frightened. It must be a, a ghost. And again, we're back in Genesis. The wind blows over the waters. The spirit broods over the face of the waters, it says. God moves on the water, controlling the chaos. Jesus, who is God, has no trouble with the ocean or this lake. He walks right out on it to them. They cry out in fear, and Jesus says something significant. Take heart, he says, it is I. Do not be afraid. But in the original, it's not it is I, it's I am. There's another echo. When Moses meets God in the burning bush and asks, who are you? The answer is, I am. The name of God is I am. And Jesus says this just as God does. In making this statement, Jesus is saying to them, don't be afraid. I am with you. I am the Lord your God. I control the winds and the wave. Have no fear. And Matthew is telling us then just who Jesus is. He's God incarnate. And of course, Peter. Peter says, oh, if it's you, command me to come out there on the water with you. So Jesus says, come on, come Peter, come out on the water, leave the safety of the boat if you want to, and come here with me. And Peter swings his legs out over the edge of the boat and steps out onto the water. Now, do you remember the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? The explorers are trying to find the Holy Grail, the cup from communion. And deep in a cave, Indiana Jones must walk across a chasm. The ancient map says, step out in faith with no doubting. But his eyes tell him he will fall to his death. And we, the viewers, agree with him. There's no bridge. There's nothing but sure and certain death. But he closes his eyes and steps forward. And then, from a different angle, we see the bridge. It's camouflaged. It matches the surrounding rock so completely that he can't even see it from the top. But it's there. He steps onto it. And he makes his way across the chasm. But in that moment, before the bridge is revealed, when Indiana Jones's leg is stepping out in faith into thin air. That's the same moment we have here with Peter. He steps out of the boat onto the water. He steps out on, of the boat and walks and says, 
hey, look at me, I can do it. And he starts walking toward Jesus, filled with joy. Then the wind hits him and he stumbles over a wave. He made a few steps and then he realized where he was. Remember the cartoon, The Roadrunner? Wiley Coyote chasing the roadrunner is always going off the edge of the cliff. And he realizes where he is and he looks down and then he falls. That's kind of like Peter. He's walking on the water until he realizes that he's walking on the water. And then he panics and sinks like a stone. He cries out, save me. Psalm 69, 1. Save me, Lord, the waters are up to my neck. You felt like that. I know I have. The waters are getting high, Lord. The flood threatens to overwhelm me. The water's going to wash me away. I'm drowning. Save me, Lord. I imagine that Peter did not have time to ponder what psalm to quote, but later he must have taken special note of Psalm 69. So Jesus saves him. Jesus grabs his arm and pulls him out. Jesus, the right hand of the Father, grabs the hapless Peter and pulls him out of the sea. And Jesus does the same for us when we are sinking down. Even when our sinking results from our foolish attempts at glory, Jesus saves us. And he says, why did you doubt? Well, we have to ask, what did Peter doubt? Did he doubt that it was Jesus on the water? Did he hear the I am and doubt that Jesus was God? Did he doubt his ability to walk out there like Jesus, to Jesus? It's hard to know. Peter just doubted that Jesus had the power to help him. Even though he could see Jesus walking on the water, he couldn't quite believe it. Even though Jesus said, I am, Peter couldn't quite hear what he meant. Even though he was out there walking on the waves, Peter couldn't quite accept what was happening. And he sank down. Now, too often preachers make Peter the bad guy. Bad Peter, he doubted. Bad Peter didn't have enough faith. It's not Peter who's bad there, it's those preachers. Only one disciple had anywhere near enough faith to get out of the boat. You see, Peter wasn't perfect, but he wasn't afraid to try. He wasn't afraid to venture out of the safety of the boat and try the waves. He wasn't afraid to put Jesus' word to the test. If it is you, Lord, and if you are indeed God, then let me come out there to you. Peter wants to come with Jesus, to be with him, to experience a whole new way of life out there on the waves. That's why he gets out of the boat. And when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he sank. That's the important part. When he cast, when cast on his own resources, he was frightened and overwhelmed by the storm. When Peter realizes what is going on, that it's impossible, he forgets to watch Jesus, he forgets to believe, and he sinks. So it's the command of Jesus to come that gives Peter the ability to do the impossible. And when he forgot to obey the command, when he focused on the impossible instead of the command, he fell, he sank down. Now the third century theologian, Origen, makes the point that it is the command of Jesus which puts them in the storm in the first place. They are sent out into the boat ahead of Jesus. He sends them there so they can be alone, but also so that they can learn that they need him in order to make the journey. Origen understands this 
as a good third century allegory, the other side refers to the life hereafter as much as the other side of the lake. And Jesus teaches the disciples that they cannot make it through life's journey and into heaven without him. Any other method of travel will be swamped by the wind and the waves. And Origen understands the boat to be the temptations and the difficulties we face in this life. Life's troubles will beat us about like a little boat tossed by the wind. And we shall make no progress unless Jesus travels with us. So I'm reminded of the theme song of the great classic of modern theater, Gilligan's Island. Remember? It was a three-hour tour. The tiny ship was tossed. If not for the courage of the fearless crew, the minnow would be lost. Foolish? Yeah, that's foolish, but it, it goes well with origin. This is how we tend to see our lives. Our tiny ships get tossed. Fearless crews work bravely to keep them from sinking. And at times, we find our song changes, maybe to the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Maybe we should just build bigger boats. But then even the Titanic sank. Maybe we could take training. We could become great admirals in the stu study of life. If we're only brave enough, if we only work hard enough, we can keep our ships from the calamity of wind and wave. And that is the great heresy of humanity, to think that we can get safely across the sea with our own wit and effort. We can't. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus and see that he's with us. He's walking to our aid in the midst of the storm, coming to still the storm and be with us. And more than that, perhaps like Peter, we need even be brave enough to step out of our boats and throw ourselves fully on Jesus' leading and command. These days, that might mean standing up for what you believe in. It might mean taking the side of minorities, you know, black people and Hispanic people, standing with them. It might mean something as simple as wearing a mask in public or, or staying home. They're all things that make us uncomfortable, all things that might rock our boats a little bit. And you probably don't want your boat rocked. You probably want things to stay calm and even get better. You certainly don't want to be out in the storm swimming. But Jesus said to Peter, come on. Peter asked for it, yes, but when he did, Jesus said, come on, come. Come out of the boat. Come out of the safety. Come out of the usual. Come into the only reality that matters. So sometimes on this journey of life, we have to rock the boat. We have to make changes. We have to see that we get close to Jesus, even if it means leaving behind who we've been with and finding new ways. Even if it means doing what seems supremely foolish, like getting out of a perfectly good boat in the middle of a storm. But when we do, we find that he will save us, he will preserve us, he will not let us drown. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.
And let us pray. Like the disciples, our boats are tossed by storms, O God. The wind and the waves blow back and forth, and we're afraid that our boats are going to sink. And we hear your command to Peter to come out onto the sea. And that scares us even more. We don't want to do that, O oh God. We want to sail our boats on peaceful seas. We want to see them skim across the lake in the sunshine with a light breeze behind us. And you call us to come out into the storm we are afraid, O oh God. Give us courage. We give you thanks for Jesus saving Peter. And we give you thanks that he saves us from our own foolishness, from sin and death, from all the things that would get between us and you. We give you thanks, O oh God. And that gives us courage and makes us bold to pray. And we pray for other people. And we pray that you will send your guiding and saving hand to people who need it the most. We pray for the people of Beirut in the aftermath of that huge explosion. We pray that they will get the aid and the help that they need. We pray for the people of our country, divided and fighting. We pray that you will pull us together. And give us all a new vision of what it means to be your people. We pray for those who are sick and ask you to give them healing. We pray for those with the coronavirus and ask especially that you heal them and that you bring safety to the doctors and the nurses and all who work in the hospitals and the people who serve us food and take care of our needs, whose jobs are essential to the functioning of our society. We ask, O oh God, that you give them safety and courage. And this week, as we mourn the death of 
Peggy Carmichael, we ask you to be with her family, to care for them, to seal in their hearts the memories that they cherish and lead them closer to you. And all the others who mourn, O oh God, we pray that you will be with them as well. And we pray that in this time, in this place, our church can make a difference, that our ministry will make a difference, that we will stand up for you. Show us where our boats need to be rocked and lead us to serve you in all that we do in big ways and small. Hear our prayers, O oh God. And hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness stares to hide his face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, or may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. So do not be afraid when the storms of life come, cling to Jesus and keep your eyes on him. And may all the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and stay with you today and every day forever. Alleluia. Amen. Guide my feet while I run this race. Yes, my Lord, guide my feet while I run this race. Yes, my Lord, guide my feet while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race.
Jesus race in vain. Yes, my Lord. Hold my hand while I run this race. Yes, my Lord. Hold my hand while I run this race. For I don't know to run this race in vain. Stand by me. Yes, my Lord, stand by me while I run this race. Yes, my Lord, stand by me while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Race in vain. Guide my feet while I this race, yes, my Lord, guide my feet while I run this race, yes, my Lord, guide my feet while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain.